Hi, I'm Alan Pollock, and June What's Neat starts right now. This is What's Neat for June 2017. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, and this month, George Bogatek stops by to show us his tricked out 3985 Challenger locomotive, complete with sound in the boiler and an array of servicing lights all around the model, just like the prototype. For layout construction, I present an update on the progress of my BTS log mill facility, showing how I built the bench work to be functional and have a furniture-like appearance. For photography this month, we shoot a model photo using real fire to light the scene, with some pretty dramatic results. Matt Herman from ESU Loak Sound came by the studio to explain in great detail how no two prime movers sound the same, from cylinder count to motor block size, along with all the various other mechanics built into a locomotive and how that affects the way that they sound while operating. Matt explains how Loke Sound captures this sound for our model locomotives. For scenery construction, we carve a scene in foam to include the correct track profile, which is dictated, of course, by water runoff. We do this real time in just a few minutes, showing the process and the tools and just how easy this is. Now, if you like S-scale narrow gauge, this past April, St. Louis was the place to be. The 32nd annual SN3 Symposium was held at the Airport Marriott Hotel. The show included many dealers and vendors specializing in SN3 products. The display layouts in the ballroom were well lit and very detailed, like the Rock Ridge layout display, complete with beautiful bench work and very realistic sound. There were a lot of S-scale brass locomotives available for purchase, along with educational clinics on all aspects of the hobby. There were layout tours of some of the most beautiful home layouts in the St. Louis area, and the contest room, which was a show unto itself, had master craftsman structures of all types covering the tables in the entire room. Next year's show will be held in Dallas, Texas, April 5th through 7th, 2018. Visit their website, www.2018sn3symposium.com, for more information on this. And with that, let's continue on with the rest of June's What's Neat. For this photography segment of What's Neat, again, you're asking yourself, maybe, what's Ken Patterson doing at two o'clock in the morning? And I can tell you tonight, I'm shooting a train set for Athern, the first responder train set, which is my 45th box art shot that I've done for train sets for many manufacturers over the years. But what I'm doing tonight is a special effects shot, which may lend itself well if you're looking to do a photo contest entry and you want to do something a little special. And tonight's photo involves fire. And what I'm doing is I'm shooting the first responder train set with all of my mountains set up in the background. And then I'm taking this, this uh, stick with fire and I'm literally waving it in the background of all the mountains. And I'm waving it behind the locomotive to light the scene. I'm also using a flashlight to light the scene and I'm shooting this in complete darkness. I've got all the home lights in the back of the house turned off for this photo shoot and I'm doing about a two minute long exposure with DCC hooked up to the tracks so that we can have the headlights lit. And so after all of that, running around with fire behind the mountains and not setting the foam on fire, I can show you the result that we got from this photo shoot. Something kind of interesting, a little bit of flair, a little excitement, just something different for the first responder train set photo that we're doing for Atherin tonight. So that's his quick photography segment on What's Neat. Mike, do 
I've downloaded all of Ken's videos, man, and I still can't get this profile right, man. What am I missing, man? I don't want you to mean like the, the track profile. Yeah, it's, How to, yeah, it just looks like yeah, it's like, a toy, but your stuff looks real. What am I missing? I think that's been in our videos. Um, let's do something. Let's just make a quick track track profile on this piece of foam, or let's go get another piece, and let's just real quick carve it out as if it's a final finished scene. The first thing you want to think about, really, and what I think about when I'm building a scene like this, Ed, is you've got to imagine where the water is going to go and you want the track to be the highest point within an area of about 9 to 12 feet on either side and these track uh, specific designs are in the railroad prototype standard books but just imagine yourself for a minute if it's raining and where's the water going to go a lot of times when I pour resin creeks I'll fill the creek with water so I can anticipate the flow of the resin before I pour it it really helps a lot in doing rivers but just imagine where the water's going to go and then carve our scenery down from there so you don't require a cork to achieve this no cork it's all about the tools and it's specifically about the type of tools you use this rasp is one of the most valuable tools on either side of the track for doing track profile so let's grab a sheet of foam and let's just carve up something real quick and and see if we can make some track look good let's all right it. all right the first thing i like to do ed is once you decide where your track's going to go i like to draw a line on either side of the track with a marker so it'll allow me to know where not to carve so the track's got a flat base so i've got this bent rasp ed and it works great for carving out the track profiles on both sides of the track and that's what we're going to do right now really quick and you're just imagining now where the water is going to go so effectively I've got the profile cut this is from the woodsmith store is that the name of the place woodcraft yes. woodcraft store that's where I found the bent rasp I've never seen these anywhere else you might be able to find them online but now what we want to do you want to carve a creek in here Sure. Yeah, Let's, and what we'll do is we'll take out the surrounding scenery. Now, mind you, if you were doing mountainous terrain, you would still have the water runoff immediately on either side of the track, and then your scenery would go up from there. But we're probably going to carve this down as a flat field on either side. Okay. Run a drainage dish th through here real quick. So let's pull out the hot foam cutter and start cutting out our drainage ditch. So let's put in a creek that will run through right here. Okay. And we'll cut out the, uh, I got a hot foam cutter here. And we'll use that real quick to cut out. Look at it. We'll just cut out a quick little area here where there'd be a culvert. You can put in a concrete culvert or wooden railroad tie culvert here. See how all this machine does is it speeds up the cut time and it squares the edges. But now you can take a long saw and cut out the main part of your creek. Yeah, that'll just what we're going to do now. Side edges. In there, pipe? Yeah, you do that. I did not get my hand. Blood? Yeah. We don't have blood on film. And I'll tell you, this tool will get you. This thing's sharp. This is a pruning saw blade. 
It is the best, most rapid, clean cutting tool for foam. Now, if you were going to put a, a small trestle or something, you could just cut that out. Sure. Or a small bridge, but sure. you're gonna, we're going to do a culvert. So. We could do either way right now. We could yeah. drop in a quick bridge, throw in some Walther's trestle bents, or drop in a piece of pipe or some sodi straws. Yeah, a pipe is a little more unusual, I think. Next step is to seal everything in latex paint so that visually you can see the topography because of pink makes it really hard to see, I yeah. think. Paint is not a nice latex brown, like a dirt color brown. Let's get let's paint let's it. Right, let's paint, right. paint it. We're gonna smooth it down with this Sureform planer because it'll help us save paint. Because we really don't need a lot of topography here once it's covered up with fake fur. Fill it in with ballast. Oh, we're doing the diorama, man. In less than 15 minutes. So like Ken said, cover the whole area. Now that gives so, you a good idea of how your uh, scene is going to look. Yes, and it starts to look like the correct topography. Right. It's that of lava. Pink foam. So we've got our track. I usually glue track down with liquid nail, but right now we're going to let the paint, since it's wet, glue down the track and glue down the dirt. And actually, we're going to use some static grass too. Because it's wet, it'll all stick. So we're going to let the dirt, or the paint. paint itself, be the glue tonight. Awesome. Because that way we could do this demonstration in less than 15 minutes. Do you ever ever paint your track first before you glue it down? You can do that. I've done that on the Garden Railroad. Yeah. I did that on the Midwest Valley Modelers layout. But what I also like to do is come back with a paintbrush and paint white ties, dark right. ties, right. and just get a little variation in the color of ties. It's very noticeable when the scene's finished. Mm -hmm. But for what we're doing tonight, essence of time. Right. Let's just cover up the scene with a little bit of dirt. We'll put some static grass on this. This dirt will get glued into place with the paint. And in fact, we'll dump the excess right off. Now you're just going to have to imagine that the track is glued down with liquid nail for this demonstration. It's not going to be because of the essence of time. Wow, looks good. Now this will still be moist enough to get the static grass to stick? No, we're going to spray a little water on top I of the dirt. See. Okay. Maybe, we, you know, wow. hell, we just put down Woodland Scenic's ground foam. That would be easy. Yeah. Now, I'd like to see now normally we would just spray this with Woodland Scenic Scenic Cement and let the dirt set up the way it is, but tonight we're going to let the paint glue it so it can dump off the excess and our scene is scenic down it's all stuck to the paint next is ballast the key to ballast isn't so much fine ballast is important but the key to ballast is the type of brush that you use to spread the ballast the best brush is a round brush like this because it allows just the tip of the brush to touch the ballast which gives you a lot more control over spreading it smooth between the ties just let the ballast fall where the gravity takes it because we've carved the topography with that in mind. Seems like a lot of ballast. It is. It really is. So we'll spread this with a paintbrush and spread the extra right off the edge. Okay, so we'll come this way. Get this out of the way. ballast away from your the rails because if it's sticking on the sides of the rails it looks really unprototypical I guess. Gotcha. And so I, I like to have the uh, tops of all the ties showing. Okay. But anyway. Okay Ed I got the Woodland Scenic Scenic Cement. You guys got everything down just right. Let's wet it and glue it in place. And we're going to use a lot of glue on this ballast. It's pretty thick. We're also going to wet the dirt so the static grass will stick in this glue and stand straight up. We'll have a scene built in less than 15 minutes. If you wanted to use fake fur, this would be the time to glue down your fake fur, color it, and put it in place. Okay. We're using static grass today. I've got some green in the gun here. The gun is on. All you simply want to do is put the uh, alligator clip on the surface. That'll create your current. So the grass will stand straight up once we apply it. And the grass will start coming out here and stand straight up. See how the grass is standing up? Mm -hmm. Now you can 
add, it will add woodland scenic, scenic uh, ground foam and various things to this. Um, the last thing we want to do is drop in some rocks here. Put a culvert underneath. For the creek? Yeah, we need to ram a, a pipe or something underneath. And we'll just spread out some rocks, different sizes, and work the vegetation in on both sides of the gravel, about where the creek would be. That's where you pour your resin base if you were pouring a resin plumbing area. And we'll put some boulders in here on the sides, a little riprap, just kind of mix it up a little bit. I'm going to put some little scenic scenic smoke on that and let that set up hard. And other than putting plywood sides on your diorama and trees and other things, I'd say you've got yourself a real quick profile, which is kind of what you were inquiring about. How do we carve down the profile real quick with yeah. you know, what tools did we Looks use? Looks a lot to do better it? than just a flat piece of 4 by 8 plywood. Absolutely. So. Good question. Yeah, it was, uh, it was just natural that you asked the question, and hopefully maybe we've got a good video out of this. Cool. But thank you for asking. And in the event this did turn out to be a video, that's this segment on scenery on What's Neat. Hi, my name is Ron Perry, and you're watching Ken Patterson's What's Neat. Here's some nice boss for my vines. For this segment of What's Neat, I've got George Bogatuck from Durango, Colorado, and he just customized a 3985 Challenger that he's going to share with us today with lights, two sets of speakers, the sound actually comes out of the boiler on this one. George, tell us about this magnificent model we're looking at. Well, Ken, what I did was with the new Tsunami 2, I had to install this into my Challenger. My personal little vice is the UP passenger set. so. I had to have this one done up properly. So with the Tsunami 2 and six lighting functions, it allowed me to light this thing up properly. So what we have is we have the headlights, we have the marker lights or the class lights up front, we have the number boards lit up, and we have the side running lights along the inside. We have a cab light on the interior and a red flashing emergency on the back of the, uh, the tender. One of the cool things that the Tsunami 2 allows me to do is to dim lights to be constant dim when they're on and I can adjust the brilliance for how bright or dim the light is and so that allowed me to do the number boards on the front at the proper brilliance and the marker lights and the running lights along the side of the locomotive at different brilliances so that it appears more realistic uh, than just simply having to play with uh, resistor values to make that work. Now what I did was I installed the decoder actually right here behind the back head up in the front of the locomotive on the locomotive side and I've got a Soundtrax Mini Cube up under this uh, exhaust stack and then I've got a Soundtrax 28 by 40 millimeter speaker in the tender so that it gives a good range of sound but also doesn't seem like the sound is coming from the tender so when the locomotive passes you you hear the sound from the locomotive and not from the tender and with the Tsunami 2 we've got a lot of cool features that you can customize the decoder for operation so we've got an articulated exhaust chuff with the wheels slipped going in and out of sync with each other. We've got an oil burning sound with an atomizer running in the background that you can hear. We've got dual steam dynamos running. We've got a non-lifting type injector and many, many more customized sounds in the Tsunami 2 that help me recreate this model more, more accurately. Man, the lights are beautiful on it. It sounds fantastic. George, thanks a lot for sharing this masterpiece with us on What's Neat. Thank you, Ken. For this layout construction segment of What's Neat, I want to give you an update on my BTS log mill complex project that I have been working on. I started the process of building the BTS log mill by figuring the space required for all of the buildings and then I started placing track around this with function, operation, and a minimum radius of 27 inches in mind. I drew lines along the edges of the track to mark the track's placement onto the foam. I then started stacking or layering two inch sheets of foam by gluing them together with a foam pro adhesive. After pressing the top layer of foam into the glue evenly all around, I placed an assortment of weights and boards on top of this for about 30 minutes until the glue cured. I then cut the new layer of foam to match the top layer and removed this which then sort of determined the size of the diorama. I repeated this process, gluing a third layer of foam into place 
making the modular section about six inches thick. I cut around the edges with a pull saw, removing the excess foam, revealing the size and the overall look of the seam. To hold the foam module, I built bench work from 2x4s, measuring from the floor to the point of the rail's height. Every leg had to be built to a different length because I wasn't going to use leg levelers on this project. Now this different length had to be compensated for, you know, to compensate for the uneven concrete floor, ensuring a level surface for the entire modular diorama. I attached these two-way locking wheels I found at the Home Depot. It's very important not only to be able to lock the wheels roll, but also to lock the pivot. Locking this pivot point ensures the modules won't wiggle from side to side on the bearings, ensuring solid and tight benchwork when complete. I rounded all the corners on the wood benchwork with a one half inch router bit, ensuring a smooth edge. I then sanded the woodwork with 120 grit smooth sandpaper, ensuring every surface that your hands come into contact with will feel smooth. I then applied red oak stain and three coats of polyurethane to finish the benchwork into a furniture-like appearance. It was now time to put all the pieces together. I rolled the benchwork into position close to the bridge module that will connect with the sawmill diorama. Now if I did all my measuring correctly, the rail's height will match perfectly on both scenes as they go together. I slid the sawmill diorama on top of the bench work and put it into place. I carefully positioned the foam even and square to the bench work, matching marks that I had already drawn underneath the foam, ensuring an exact placement on top of the smooth bench work. When I rolled the scene into position, it matched the height of the adjoining module perfectly. I love it when a plan goes together like this. Now, to hold the foam from sliding on the top of the smooth bench work, I drilled a few holes underneath the bottom of the wood at a 45 degree angle, countersunk, and then I put in three inch screws, screwing these screws up into the foam, ensuring that things won't slide sideways at all, but yet I can take them out easily when I need to remove things and take things outside. I also attached brass plumb bobs to each end of the bench work. These will point to an X on the floor. This will ensure that when the scenes are taken outside for photography and video, and then they are brought back in, they can be placed in their exact locations, matching the plumb bob's point to the center X on the floor, which will guarantee rail alignment when everything is reassembled. And that's a quick update on the pro progress of the log mill project that I've been working on. Simply the bench work was a big hurdle to get over, but now it'll be time to start laying track and working on the scenery and working on the edges of the uh, foam diorama, finishing things off with woodwork, and we'll do follow-ups on future What's Neat. So that's this layout construction segment for What's Neat. For our, for our product line and there's a reason why we've done so many because there's a lot of differences in Prime Mover. And we've talked a little bit about education and the mission that I'm on to, to educate um, and part of that is explaining why we've done so many Prime Movers. Um, every serial number of, of every locomotive, if you could have five SD40-2s, from serial number to serial number to serial number, they will all sound different. There's going to be, uh, sometimes they have a new turbo put into them, sometimes they have different air compressors, um, just uh, low idle, high idle. Uh, you know, SD40-2s, there were 3,000 of them made, so they were made over many, many years. So advancements happened, uh, you had dynamic range, or uh, extended range dynamics, um, you had different types of fans on them, so there was a lot of differences. So that's just one engine. So let me explain as we go down through all these beautiful engines behind us why we've created some of the prime movers that we have and, and what we've got available. 
So the first is just a, an Athern GP38-2. Uh, this is a 16-cylinder 645E. This is a non-turbo locomotive. We've, because so many differences do exist between prime movers and engine-to-engine, and engine, we've actually got three or four of those recorded now. So we have some variation. So if you bought three GP38-2s and they all came with low sound, you could actually upload the two other differences uh, within that locomotive because they're a programmable decoder. Um, we don't just have a GP, or a, I'm sorry, a 645 turbo and a 645 non-turbo. We have about every cylinder and every block variation that came available, which means this is a 16-cylinder 645E. The next one is a 12-cylinder 645E. Um, we're working on an 8-cylinder 645E. Um, you know, there's lots of variation. This is a GP15. We've recorded multiple gp 15 so you have some variation just in that model. But we've also done multiple SW1500s. They have a little bit different stack, something more like this one over here. Um, but, you know, they're, they're still the 645E prime mover. So they have a similar sound, but just enough to be different so that you have those subtleties. So you can run multiple unit lash-ups and have that, that distinguishability in between them. The next is a 567. This is a 16 cylinder 567. We have now recorded, I believe, almost every 567 block available. Again, this is a 16 cylinder, but there were 16 cylinder A's and B's and C's and B C's, and we've done just about every one. We've done with um, exhaust silencers, without. Um, we've done um, you know, multiple stack variations. This is a 12 cylinder 567. This is a six cylinder 567. Last week I recorded an eight cylinder 567. And you know, those are, there's all those variations in between. Now, when we get to the 16 again, there's lots of variations. There's even times where in both the 12 and the 16s, they've replaced the power assemblies with 645 power assemblies. We've recorded those too. We've even got different uh, exhausts. We've got two, two exhausts for power assemblies using 645s, and we've got four exhausts for things like GP16s, which there was programs out and hundreds and hundreds of engines existed that way. Um, SW1200s, same thing. They had 12 cylinder uh, 645 power assemblies put in. Um, there's lots and lots of variation, and that's just the 567s. Here's another variation of a 567. This is a 567D3. This would happen to be a GP30. Um, they're also good for SD24s and GP35s. Um, if you go back to the, the D2s um, and, and before, we recorded a GP20. GP20 has a little bit different idle speed. So even though it's a 567 turbo, not all 567 turbos are the same. So again, more variation. Here's a couple of Alcos. Uh, this is a 16 cylinder or, uh, 251. We've recorded C engines, we've recorded D engines. Um, we've recorded 12 cylinder 251Bs and, and multiples of them. We have, uh, again, different governors. Um, we've got different startups in the 16 cylinder versions. We've done air start, we've done electric start. Um, we've done multiples of all of those prime movers as well. We've done C420s, M420s, RS11s, RS18s, all 12-cylinder 251s, but they all sound different, and we want those variations in between. Uh, we've done 244s, we've done 8-cylinder 251s, we've done 6-cylinder 251s. Every one of them has these, its own subtleties, its own character, and we want that on the layout. If not, you just have monotony, and it gets boring because everything starts to sound the same. Um, this is a, a new engine. Um, this is a SD39. We, there's, this is the number 40 is about the only SD39 that still exists and runs. I've just recorded that exact engine. So that's a 12 cylinder 645 with a turbo. The next one is a 16 cylinder 645 with a turbo. That's that SD40-2 that we just talked about. We've also done a 20 cylinder 645 with a turbo. And many of these, we've done multiples of them. We've done a couple, we've done a GP39-2 and we've done an SD39-2, both 1260, or 12 cylinder 645 E3s. Uh, we've done about five SD40-2s, high idles, low idles, extended range dynamics, normal dynamics, without dynamics, uh, dash twos, dash threes. With the electronics, they make things happen at a different pace, a different rate. Um, your idling's a little bit different. 
um, 45, 45-2s, 45-2Ts. There's lots and lots of variation. We just want to make sure that everything doesn't sound the same because that's that fourth dimension that nobody really thinks about. They're always worried about the detail on the outside, the, the beautiful streets and the houses and the trees and the, whether it's got the right grab irons or not, whether it's got the right lift rings in the right places. Well, it's time to super detail that sound inside as well. And that's what we're after. So. Um, why don't we hear some of them run? Why don't we take some out and uh, you know, we'll go switch an industry.